Hello everyone and welcome to the Iowa Master Gardener Growing Season webcast series. Today is the first in part of a three-part series. Today we're going to be talking about how to garden in the shade. Next time we'll be talking about diagnosing tree problems. And finally, at the last webinar, we'll be talking about insects. Here's a roadmap for today's webcast. First, we're going to talk about shade gardening with Dr. Denny Schrock. We'll pause for a discussion, and then we'll hear from Master Gardener Megan Will about the Search for Excellence Award. And you can use those discussion questions at the end to start to plan to apply for your Search for Excellence Award. A couple materials we have for you today. The first one is a worksheet to follow along with the presentation today. And the second one is an evaluation so that you can give us valuable feedback. Please fill out the evaluation form and hand it to the Extension staff who's hosting the webcast today. They'll send it in. Don't forget to log your continuing education hours. If you are an Iowa Master Gardener, please log on to the Master Gardener Volunteer Reporting System and report the two continuing education hours that you've earned today. Wonderful! First, we're going to have Dr. Denny Schrock present about shade gardening. Hello, this is Dr. Denny Schrock. We're uh, here today to talk a little bit about shade gardening, got shade, uh, particularly about woodland natives for Iowa. Specifically, we've got a number of topics of discussion we'd like to uh, uh, talk about today. One is the various types of shade that are involved in growing plants, so various shady, shady site considerations as well as uh, light. We've got some design features to, to talk about. Uh, we want to cover a little bit about what does it mean to be a native plant, uh, what plants are native, uh, how, how should that be defined. We also want to talk a bit about um, managing invasive plants, particularly plants that uh, tend to invade woodlands here in Iowa. Um, so that's the, the first section of the, the presentation. And then we'll be talking about what I call the good guys. And I've broken those uh, desirable plants or woodland plants into several different categories. Uh, the first of those is what we call the early spring ephemerals, those that uh, bloom first thing in the, the season and uh, are done before uh, the middle of the growing season. Uh, we've got a group that are called fantastic ferns and foliage, uh, plants that are grown primarily for their foliage rather than for the flowers that they may produce. We have another group that are the spring and summer standbys, ones that bloom uh, middle to uh, the later part of the summer. And then finally, the autumnal afterglow, uh, ones that uh, provide some interest in the woodlands late in the season, perhaps not from flowers, but perhaps from berries instead. As we take a look at growing plants in the shade, uh, there are a number of things that we should keep in mind as we're uh, looking at how to grow the plants or what, what's required for growing plants in those areas. Uh, first of these, and perhaps foremost, are the, the various light levels because not all shade is created equal. Uh, as you might imagine, some places there's very dense shade, others much lighter shade, and we'll uh, go through and, and uh, help you understand or define what those differences are in the, the various types of shade that plants might be exposed to. One thing that uh, often is not uh, first and foremost in mind in growing plants in the shade is that there definitely is a change in the uh, or competition from for moisture and nutrients uh, by plants growing in the shade. As we think about uh, large trees can suck up a lot of moisture as well as nutrients and so when you're growing uh, herbaceous plant materials underneath those trees, uh, you need to keep in mind that they might need extra water, or perhaps a little bit of extra uh, uh, nutrition. Air circulation can be a, a, pa a problem for plants growing in the shade as well. Uh, the trees and shrubs create blockage of air movement, and so you may have to think about uh, providing uh, disease control or uh, pl grow plants that are, are resistant to disease problems. 
And then there are certain design elements that apply not only to the sh uh, shade or sunlight, but, but things that are really specific to shade because of the, the type of light that's involved there. So we'll take a look at each of these uh, categories individually here. As we uh, look at the shades of shade, as I'm calling it here, uh, we can think about uh, various definitions. Uh, full shade, uh, you may uh, well know that uh, we've got that sort of defined as uh, full shade means that there's really no direct sunlight all day long. Um, so no, no sunlight at all. Um, it may, however, be some reflected light. So perhaps you're growing next to a wall that... Uh, uh, reflects some light into the area, but uh, in, there's no direct sunlight getting to this, this spot. So full shade or uh, sometimes also called dense shade. We'll kind of use those terms interchangeably. The uh, second group there uh, is the part shade or medium shade. And the definition there is that uh, part shade, it's shaded most of the day, but perhaps there's a, a few hours of sunlight, uh, usually early in the morning or late in the afternoon, um, so that uh, they're definitely shade throughout the, the mid portion of the day and perhaps just a little bit of sunlight early and late in the day. Um, this situation also applies to, say, a north-facing slope uh, where the low angle of the sun uh, really does not uh, hit that, that site. So part shade, medium shade in those situations. Light shade or dappled shade would be where uh, the, the, there's no direct sunlight through the middle portion of the day for sure, uh, or maybe I'll get the edge of the shade where it's getting morning sun, but afternoon shade. Uh, dappled shade could be where there's a situation with uh, trees with a uh, light canopy, uh, more of an open canopy so that uh, uh, some light will filter down through throughout the day. So the plants underneath get sort of a mix of, of sun and shade throughout the day. Then there's also what I would call seasonal shade, um, that sometimes uh, we have sun for a site early in the growing season before trees leaf out, but later on in the season, that particular site is going to be uh, actually even fairly dense, densely shaded, perhaps. So situations where full shade or dense shade apply would be uh, similar to uh, the situation where we've got uh, spruce trees or pine trees uh, that have a, a dense evergreen canopy. Uh, and in the case here, uh, there's often misconception that the reason the plants don't grow under an evergreen tree like a spruce tree is because of the acidity from the dropping needles. And that's really not the case. Uh, the pH really doesn't change much underneath these trees. It's more a matter of that dense shade and perhaps also a combination of uh, the competition from the, the root systems uh, sucking up that extra moisture uh, that the reason that plants won't grow in it. So that's a, a, a definite full shade or dense shade situation. In the, the case of deciduous trees, like the maples there in the upper right image, um, they will have no leaves during the early spring, but through most of the growing season, uh, they have such a dense canopy of foliage that little or no light reaches the, the ground. And so that can be another situation where we've got full or dense shade. Part shade or medium shade uh, would be a situation like we see in the lower left there where uh, these are oak trees that are fairly widely spaced, uh, quite a bit of open canopy there. So a lot of light filters down through to the, the base of the ground. And additionally, there's some open spaces around it so that early morning and late evening sun may uh, filter into into this area. So uh, these oak savanna type situations are, are a part shade or medium shade. The other picture you see there is on the north side or north facing uh, portion of a two story building where the building itself creates the shade and only early in the morning or late in the evening is there any direct sun that hits this garden. Uh, in, in between times, so through the middle part of the day, uh, completely shaded. So you can see some of our uh, shade type uh, non-natives, but they're standbys. We've got hostas, astilbes, um, hookahs, ajuga, uh, a, a lot of the 
kind of workhorse shade plants uh, will grow well in this area because it's uh, bright enough that they can uh, thrive. The light shade or dappled shade, as we said, would be where you, the, the garden may be receiving sunlight all morning long, but by midday as the sun gets overhead, um, the garden is shaded. So the lower left photo there shows the uh, Hakanakloa, the Japanese forest grass in the foreground, the Hukura, Hostas, uh, yellow flowered Corydalus there a little bit farther back, chartreuse foliage from a uh, Aurelia Sun King. Um, there's also a Kirin Gishima uh, with large sort of maple like looking leaves to the right of the Sun King. And then a little bit further back, there's some Brunneras uh, or Siberian Bugloss with a silvery foliage. All of these plants get full morning sun, but by midday they're shaded. And then all afternoon, when the sun is more intense, they are also getting that shade. So they really thrive here sort of at the edge of the woodland with the morning sun. On the right, you see dappled shade. And that's a, a situation where you can see the kind of splotches of sunlight on the walkway there. And those splotches of light will reach the plants that are growing next to it as well. So the... Uh, Forget-me-not there with the light blue flowers in the foreground. Um, there's some hostas. There's some uh, hydrangeas, uh, peonies, and uh, coral bells a little bit farther back. All of those plants will do pretty well in this sort of dappled light in this situation. Seasonal shade. We can see here on the left uh, a deciduous woodland. This particular image was taken right here on the ISU campus uh, early this spring when the trees had not yet leafed out and yet the uh, forest floor has a full green carpet. So a lot of these plants will pop out early in the springtime, uh, get all the photosynthesis that they need before the, the shade of the trees uh, cuts down on the light and they have a, then a very little short life cycle, uh, what we call spring ephemerals. And we'll We'll look at a lot of spring ephemerals a little bit later on in the presentation today. So later on, um, in the f by summer and fall, as you see the fall situation there, uh, the shade is so uh, full that, that it would be considered full or dense shade. So uh, what was a sunny site in the early spring now is full shade. So that changes throughout the year. At the right there, you can see a rose garden protected for winter. As we know, roses need pretty much full sun to grow well. Uh, and throughout the growing season, this site does receive full sun. But in the winter, uh, you can see the uh, lengthening of the shadows uh, from the low winter sun. Uh, it's uh, really in a, what I would call a, a partly shaded site. So this reminds us that we need to look at our shady garden sites throughout the growing season or throughout the entire year to perhaps determine what level of shade the site is receiving, whether it's dense shade or medium shade or, or light shade, um, because those patterns will change throughout the year and that may dictate what plants will grow well in that particular location. In addition to light levels, the nutrient and moisture competition from tree roots can have a significant impact on the uh, amount of growth or types of plants that can be grown in shady sites. You can see in these images uh, what uh, an effect the, the tree roots have both in the left and right. Um, they're a little bit exposed. We would hope that they still would stay underground, but uh, this gives you the visual image anyway of how extensive the root system is under uh, some of these trees. And so if you're trying to grow plants in the shade, you need to keep in mind that the, the tree roots are going to provide a lot of competition, both for the moisture and for the nutrients that are there. So it may take a little bit of extra supplemental watering, unless the plant's extremely drought tolerant as well, in order for you to uh, get good growth. Of course, native plants tend to be well adapted to this situation if they're native woodland plants, because that's where they uh, have uh, uh, evolved. Air circulation, a big factor in uh, shady sites as well. Uh, whether it is a windbreak, such as you see in the upper left there from the arborvitae that uh, cuts off airflow, 
or whether it's just a combination of trees and shrubs in a, a woodland setting, there may not be as much air movement in that sort of dense canopy. On the other hand, if it's a, a, a single tree out in a more open area uh, that's been highly limbed up, you may get what's called the Venturi effect, that is a speeding up of the wind underneath the canopy of the tree. You perhaps have uh, observed that yourself if you're sitting under the shade of a tree in a hot summer day, that there's more breeze under the tree than out in the open, simply because the air is being compressed to go underneath that canopy, and so it can speed things up. So uh, a, if it's not a densely shaded area, uh, you may actually have better air circulation in the shade. But if you do have lack of air circulation, you're going to need to think about what sorts of disease problems may be present for the plants that grow there. In the lower left, we see uh, a viburnum that is covered in a white powdery substance. Uh, those of you uh, in Master Gardener Training Program sure have seen pictures similar to this. Uh, perhaps you have a lilac shrub that growing in, the, in a shady site that uh, develops this white powdery substance, powdery mildew. Um, some, some cases you can't do a lot about it because it, it's just present there when we've got high humidity and, and poor air circulation. Uh, may not cause death of the plant or even severe injury, but it certainly doesn't look great. So uh, you want to grow plants that may not be susceptible to powdery mildew in a, a area with poor air circulation. At the upper right, there you see a, a crane's bill or a perennial geranium that has some brownish spots on the foliage. That's a leaf spot disease, a fungal leaf spot that uh, tends to be more of a problem in a, in a shady site. Um, not only is air movement less there, uh, the moisture stays on the, the foliage longer because of the poor air movement, so diseases are more likely to develop. Design elements that uh, we need to keep in mind as we're growing plants in the shade. Um, the the focal point becomes very important for shady sites because it tends to be a little bit darker. We need something that's really going to pop out and, and grab your attention. So um, because the foliage may be lots of greenery, uh, it may be more difficult to, to grab that attention unless you use a, a structure of some sort. So the arbor with gate on it uh, is a, a good way to kind of draw your attention into the, the lower left image there, uh, lead your eye down the, the line of the path. In the upper right, a, uh, a structure like the, the fountain, uh, not only visually, but also with the sound of the trickling water, will tend to draw your eye into that and, and create the focal point for an attractive landscape. Color and texture are uh, important in shady areas as well, and we'll take a look at each of those individually as we uh, think what sort of design features uh, apply there. As far as color goes, pastel colors, the pinks, the whites, creams, light shades uh, are uh, ones that will show up better in the shade than deeper colors like the reds and purples and blues. Those darker colors tend to recede into the, the shadows, whereas the, the pastels and lighter or brighter colors like oranges and yellows um, will, will pop more in the, in the shade. Now, it's sometimes difficult to get that pop of color in the shade simply because most plants don't bloom as well in shade as they do in full sun. So uh, one thing that you can do is is provide some of that lightness and brightness from foliage. In the lower left there, you can see a, a pachysandra that has a variegated foliage. So the creamy white edge to the leaf is going to show up much better than if it were a solid green leaf. Um, lightens and brightens the, the, the shady spot. Or the uh, image there in the, the lower center picture, um, we get a lot of color from the uh, two different types of pink caladiums, the heart-shaped leaves there. We've got a uh, Rex begonia that has a green edge to the leaf with a silver stripe and a pink stripe and a deep maroon center. 
that deep maroon center would really get lost if we didn't have the lighter colors surrounding it. So uh, you can you can grow darker uh, colored foliage in the, in the shade, especially if you contrast it with the, the lighter ones. Um, the other plant there is the uh, sort of chartreuse hookera, uh, and that, that sort of yellowish green uh, tends to pop in the shade as well. As far as texture goes uh, as a design element, um, the fine textures like from ferns uh, often show up pretty well. Um, they, the, you like the contrast of that fine texture with a, a, a deeper or larger, uh, bolder texture. Uh, in the upper right, you can see the Aurelia Sun King that's got not only the chartreuse foliage, which shows up, um, medium texture, but contrast that with the, uh, finer texture of the Corydalus, the yellow flowered one there, or the silvery foliage of the, uh, Brunnera, the Siberian bugloss to its left. Uh, various combinations of, of textures and, and colors uh, really show up in, in that shady site. Plant form may also be more important in the shade than it is in the sun. The lower center picture shows the weeping form of a hemlock uh, contrasted with sort of the low creeping nature of the uh, uh, Japanese mondo grass. Um, so weeping, upright forms, mounded forms, uh, take on greater importance in the shade. As we look at and talking about native plants, uh, it may be important to have some sort of definition of, of what really is native. This particular map shows the uh, historic Iowa vegetation from about the, the middle of uh, the 1800s, so primarily before European settlement uh, in the state. The deep green or forest green uh, markings there are what was timber or woodland, and the um, medium or lighter green are areas that were scattered trees and brush, uh, what we might call the, the savanna. Now, it's apparent to me that this uh, the, the map was made from a survey on a county-by-county county basis because you can see some real distinct county lines there. And I uh, really seriously doubt that uh, the uh, the vegetation changed right at the county line from timber woodland to uh, scattered brush and trees. So it may have been a matter of interpretation. But we can use the, sort of that combination of the, the, the greens anyway were, were woodland types areas. The yellows are the prairie areas, and you can see that Iowa really is or, or was a, a prairie state. So uh, much of the state uh, just really didn't have native uh, woodland plants, uh, especially as you look the farther west you go, lower uh, moisture content, uh, more prairie type areas. Uh, there the just would not be those uh, plants that would be native locally. Um, the, the blues on this map are rivers, lakes, and there's some wetlands. And then uh, you may be able to see a few red dots here and there as, as settlements uh, there in the mid-1800s. But what we want to point out with this is that um, the definition of na native you may have to think about. Um, when we're talking about native, and uh, in my presentation today I'm talking about native to the state of Iowa, um, certain... Uh, uh, people use a definition of native is that unless it was uh, found within 50 miles or some specific amount of mileage from a specific site, it's not considered native. So we also might even expand that the opposite direction and say uh, as long as it's native to the upper Midwest or native to the U.S., we can consider it a native plant. However, uh, for today's purpose, we're going to be talking about native to the state of Iowa. Um, if you want to use a more stringent definition, uh, you certainly may, but I think it's important to know what we mean when we're talking here about native. We also might want to think about, in defining our native, keep in mind what I'm calling here climate creep. Um, that is to say, comparing the two maps of Iowa that you see here, back in 1990, the USDA uh, hardiness zones 
uh, pretty much divided the state of Iowa in half with the northern half of the state in zone four and the uh, southern half of the state in zone five. So uh, at that point, uh, it was pretty much you know a, a direct split. Compared to currently in 2016, USD hardiness zones uh, show that virtually all of the state is in zone five, uh, except the northwest corner and the northeast corner, which are the, the deepest blue on this map. Um, the other split there in the, the blues are the uh, northern two-thirds of the state is zone 5A, so a little bit colder than zone 5B in the uh, southern third of the state. And then there's a, a tiny little tip of uh, zone 6 down in Lee County by Keokuk. But anyway, this shows that things have changed, that climate change is a reality here in Iowa. And so things that uh, may have been adapted to the climatic conditions uh, back in the 1990s or say back in the 1850s, we can go back further, that uh, definitely things are, are warming up because of climate change. And so things that may be, have be native to Missouri may now be actually better adapted to Iowa. So we might want to expand our definition of native plant to include things that are going to be better adapted to the coming climate that's uh, present in Iowa. Another term sort of related to native plants is that of the naturalized plants. And um, there's a couple ways of looking at naturalized plants. Um, one of these is that uh, of the upper right there where we see crocus that have been planted in a lawn. And uh, this type of treatment is called naturalizing. The, the corms are planted in the lawn. The flowers are allowed to bloom. And the mowing of the lawn is delayed long enough so that the foliage can build up the corm for next year's bulbs. And so the, the corms gradually spread to make larger clumps. Now, um, this is not going to spread beyond where the planting has occurred. So it's a very, very localized sort of increase and in spread. Uh, but that's one way of looking at naturalized plants. The other two plants you see on here are also naturalized plants. They are not native to Iowa but they have spread throughout the state and have become what are called naturalized. They they reproduce on their own out in nature without being planted. So Dame's Rocket, the purple one on the, the lower left there, uh, is a European native that was introduced uh, and has lovely purple flowers in the springtime. But it is sometimes weedy enough that in, in certain areas it's almost becoming uh, invasive. So uh, some people think that it ought to be removed because it is crowding out native prairie plants. It, it is a sunny plant, although it often goes into the edges of woodlands. If you've uh, driven down uh, rural roadsides in Iowa in the summertime, you've probably seen uh, some of the chicory, the, the blue flowers there in the center. These two were introduced by uh, European settlers, uh, partly for the uh, salad nature. Uh, the, the greens are used in salads, and the roots are sometimes used as a coffee substitute, or were uh, used as a coffee substitute, and so they were intentionally planted. But much like dandelions, the, uh, they get fluffy seed heads that blow around and spread pretty widely. So it is an introduced plant. It's not considered invasive, um, because it doesn't choke out a lot of other plants, but it certainly can be considered a weedy plant. So all of these are various situations where plants are naturalized, may be occurring in nature, but they're not native. Another term related to uh, in defining about native plants uh, is a, a term called nativar. Um, this is a sort of a, a, a coined word, uh, a permutation of the word cultivar, which, as you may know, is a cultivated variety. Uh, and so a nativar is a cultivated variety of a native plant. Uh, many of us are familiar with nativars of prairie plants. If we think about how many of the different types of cone flowers are now available, 
uh, used to call them purple coneflowers, but they're now available in yellows and oranges and reds and all sorts of colors uh, because they've been crossbred and, and selected. Um, so those are not truly native plants anymore, but they were derived from native plants. And so those particular cultivars can be termed nativars. A couple examples we see in this photo that are more related to shade type plants would be the Brise d'Anjou uh, polymonium or Jacob's Ladder in the lower left that has the uh, variegated foliage. It's got the creamy white edge to the, the uh, leaflets there. Uh, uh, same purple flowers that the native plant has, but that variegation is what really separates it from the native species. Um, obviously, this is a plant that's going to really stand out in the shade because of the variegation. Uh, it brightens the shade, so it is something you might want to think about growing as a native R. But you need to keep in mind that because it has been selected, it's not truly a native plant anymore. It's been uh, selected down to a specific characteristics or category, so um, some people would not consider it native at all, even though it was derived from a native plant. In the uh, center there, you see a white form of the uh, Virginia bluebell. Um, you may have noticed uh, in native stands that there are uh, often variations from blue to pink, but very occasionally or very very seldom there are uh, white ones that show up. So this would be an alba form. Uh, uh, could be a selection of a, a native var for a white formed um, Virginia bluebell. Up in the upper right corner, we have Solomon seal. It's got the uh, streaked or variegated foliage, the variegata form. And that too shows up well in the, the darker uh, light forms of the shade because of the streaking on the foliage. But keep in mind that native ours are a selection from native plants. We also uh, want to talk a little bit here about uh, when we're thinking about some of those introduced plants, uh, we have to be careful that they are not an invasive plant. Um, talking a little bit here about what's the difference between invasive and aggressive. Well, an invasive plant is one that uh, has some sort of economic and or environmental harm. So usually it means it's going to be crowding out some of the native plant species. Uh, usually it spreads very readily, very widely. Uh, it may do that on its own or it may have a vector such as birds spreading uh, berries. So invasive ones are ones that uh, should definitely be removed. The On the left here we see uh, purple loosestrife, which is a plant that uh, self-seeds extremely readily and can overtake wetland situations. Not so much in the shade, but in uh, sunny areas it can overtake wetlands. So purple loosestrife, even though it may have beautiful purple flowers, is a plant that should no longer be planted, illegal to plant in the state of Iowa, and um, should be removed if you, you do see them. Whereas the plant on the right, the uh, bishop's weed or snow on the mountain, um, is a plant that can spread pretty widely and readily, but the spread of it is through the rhizomes or through the root system. So it's more of a localized spread. So it's a, uh, a an aggressive spreader or a thug, we might say, in the landscape. But you can pretty well keep it under control simply by uh, mowing off around the edges of the, the planting where you have it. So um, not considered invasive, but certainly aggressive. Some plants that do fit into that invasive category we want to take a look at are the um, bush type or amber honeysuckle. Um, this is a plant introduced that has the fragrant white or creamy flowers in the springtime. Um, and then those develop into attractive red berries, which are not only pretty to look at, but uh, the birds find very attractive to eat as well. And therein lies the problem. The birds eat the berries and they uh, spread them as they fly around and, and defecate. Um, as these large shrubs uh, grow, they're going to uh, uh, block out native plants because 
the uh, honeysuckle leaves out very early in the springtime and holds on to its foliage very late in the fall. So uh, it creates shade for understory plants that normally would have been uh, receiving sunlight at least during the uh, portion of the, the season when the uh, deciduous trees above are not leafed out. So uh, it's good to grub out those honeysuckles if you see them. Um, may have to treat with a uh, herbicide, um, brush type killer like glyphosate, uh, and it may take repeat, repeat treatments. One thing about this, because the honeysuckle holds its foliage so late in the season, um, you may be able to spray the herbicide at that time because if nothing else is leafed out, it won't. the other things will not take up the herbicide as readily as the uh, honeysuckle. Uh, you can also cut back the, the uh, shrub and directly apply the uh, herbicide to the cut stump, and that's a good way to get gr greater uptake and kill off the uh, honeysuckles that are undesirable. Garlic mustard has become a, an invasive plant in Iowa. Um, not a real large plant, and actually it's, it's more of a, uh, a, a winter annual in that, um, the, uh, or biennial, it can be biennial too. Uh, so it uh, greens up early in the springtime, flowers with these four-petaled white flowers early on in the season, and then by midsummer the little seed pods are uh, mature and they'll spread, and those seeds are viable for at least five years. So important if you're going to pull out the uh, garlic mustard, do it early in the season before those seeds form. And you may have to go back for, as I said, five years in a row to uh, eradicate the patch because some of the seed bank will um, come become viable and, and uh, grow in the, the following seasons. So it takes persistence to get rid of the garlic mustard. Um, the other thing is that this was introduced by European settlers because of the sort of garlicky flavor of the foliage. So uh, this is one you can eat to get rid of, too. Make a lemons out of lemonade, if you will, or garlic mustard salads out of garlic mustard. The common buckthorn, Rhamnus cathartica, uh, is a, an invasive plant uh, that uh, you can see here has glossy blackberries, a very large shrub uh, up to 20 feet tall tends to be more of a problem sort of at the edges of the woodlands. It won't grow in real dense shade, uh, but uh, certainly can take over partly shaded areas or, or edges of woodlands. Um, birds are attracted to the berries, so much like the honeysuckle, you want to uh, get rid of the, uh, the uh, plant before it forms the berries. Um, because it's a, a large woody shrub, it's going to take repeated grubbing out or repeated uh, herbicide treatments to, to get rid of this plant. Similarly, the multiflora rose, which in the uh, late spring, early summer, has clusters of pretty white flowers uh, that then develop into the red berries or hips uh, that birds like. And those spread, of course, as a rose, it has uh, thorny stems that can be uh, make it nasty to remove, but like the other uh, shrubby type or, or woody plants, uh, you need to grub it out repeatedly and or use herbicide treatments to get rid of it. Now, the, the remaining ones I'm talking about here in our invasive plants, if, we, if you will, are what I would say are on the invasive watch list. They may not have been declared invasive uh, here in Iowa, but in certain areas of the country, they have become invasive. And so they're ones we ought to be aware of, perhaps avoid planting now so that they won't become invasive in Iowa. The first of these is the autumn olive, Eleagnus umbellata, which is a close relative of the Russian olive. So it has sort of silvery gray foliage to green foliage, uh, but instead of the uh, grayish green fruits, it has bright red berries that are attractive to birds. So much like honeysuckle, going to spread that way. So avoid planting autumn olive, and if you do see it, uh, grub it out. Bittersweet, a uh, popular plant for fall decorations, uh, but there are, is a native type and a, an oriental type. The native type, of course, is not going to be invasive. It's, it's native here, so it's fine to grow. But the oriental bittersweet can become invasive in certain areas. So important to know or distinguish the difference. And it can be difficult because they look quite similar. 
So what is the difference? Well, the Oriental Bittersweet, uh, both are vines. The Oriental Bittersweet has um, small thorns all along the vine, whereas the native one is a smooth-stemmed type. Also, the Oriental forms its berries all along the vine in the leaf axle. So you can see there in the uh, picture on the left that not only are there berries at the tip, but there are also berries along the, the stem farther down. Whereas the Native American bittersweet only forms berries at the very tips of the vine. Um, the uh, other thing that can help distinguish is the uh, American one tends to have a more orange capsule and the uh, oriental one tends to have more of a yellow capsule with the, the reddish or orange fruit. Japanese barberry is a uh, thorny shrub that uh, has become uh, outlawed in certain areas of the northeastern United States because it is spreading into woodlands. So uh, you can see here the Hel Hellman pillar barberry on the left with the purplish foliage and the uh, red elongated berries that are attractive to birds. Um, those berries can cling to the, the shrub for a long time. On the right you see the berries from last year are still present while the flowers are blooming there uh, in the springtime again. So again, uh, with these berries can become invasive in the woodland, so grub those out uh, and perhaps avoid planting uh, barberries. They, they've not become invasive in Iowa, but something I think we need to be on the lookout for as a possibility. Norway maple, Acer platinoides, has also uh, been banned in much of the northeastern United States. Um, on the the purple foliage of the Schwedler maple there on the left is a you know a lawn type shade tree, and in that particular situation, it may not be a problem uh, because the way that the Norway maple becomes invasive is that uh, much like silver maples uh, or other maples, it forms the little winged helicopters or samaras that uh, fall to the ground and perhaps blow a uh, few dozen or a few hundreds of feet uh, away from the tree. So as long as the Norway maple is not anywhere near woodland, it's not going to become invasive in the woodlands. Uh, the farther east we go, the more woodlands there are and the more likelihood of the uh, Norway maple taking over and becoming invasive in, in the woodlands. So uh, as a uh, lawn tree, perhaps it's not a problem, but keep it away from woodlands. The tree of heaven, Elanthus altissima, uh, kind of looks like a big overgrown uh, sumac with its uh, compound pinnate leaves there. But instead of having uh, tight clusters of uh, reddish berries at, at the uh, growing point there, it has more of a, a open uh, panicle type of uh, a cluster of pinkish fruits or seeds uh, that will drop off and uh, can uh, germinate and grow in, in almost any soil type or the, the tightest of situations. Uh, I've often seen these growing out of little cracks and cement in sidewalks. So uh, it can be pretty invasive, not only through the spread of the seeds, but uh, similar to sumac, it will sprout from the root system and create additional um, spread that way. A favorite plant in fall uh, for many people is the burning bush or winged euonymus. And this is another one that's on that invasive watch list in uh, much of the uh, northeastern United States. Um, these orange berries that you see at the left there uh, drop off the plant, uh, create seedlings, or birds will eat them and spread them long distances. So uh, it's one that uh, perhaps should be watched. Uh, I've not seen it become too invasive here in Iowa, but uh, definitely something we should be watching for and perhaps avoid planting these burning bushes that may become invasive. The final one here on our invasive watch list is the uh, porcelain berry or Ampelopsis breva pedunculata. That's quite a mouthful to say. Um, it's a vine, and the one that's most commonly grown as an ornamental is the variegated form, which you see a close-up of on the right. Now, certainly that variegation uh, is a, a nice brightener for shady areas, but it, uh, you can also see there it's got berries. Uh, early on, those berries are sort of greenish white or yellow. 
uh, but eventually they turn a uh, sort of turquoise blue, which is also extremely attractive. However, like other buried plants, those are attractive to uh, birds as well as uh, other wildlife, too, uh, can spread uh, those uh, porcelain berries. So this is one that probably should not be planted in, in Iowa because of the potential for it to become invasive. What we'd like for you to do now, uh, we'll take a little break from our lecture here, give you a chance to discuss a little bit what are some things that you, you as Master Gardener volunteers or as uh, individual citizens can do to uh, raise awareness about invasive plants? Um, what would you like to learn about invasive plants, how to control them, uh, other plants that might be on that invasive watch list, and what other steps might you take to uh, uh, control and manage potential invasive plants? All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, on the last half of the uh, webinar presentation about uh, shade plants, we're going to talk a little bit about what I'm calling the good guys, the uh, Iowa natives for shade. And I don't want to imply that non-native shade plants are bad for Iowa. Uh, certainly there are a lot of uh, great standbys such as hostas and uh, stillbees and uh, hookeras that, that we grow and are, are, are good plants for the landscape, but we wanted to concentrate today particularly on native plants. So as I mentioned early on, we've got uh, uh, several different groupings. We've got the early spring ephemerals, the ones that bloom early on, the fantastic ferns and foliage, the ones that are sort of the, the workhorses just because of their background effect, uh, spring and summer standbys, the ones that bloom after the early spring uh, cluster of, of uh, woodland plants and then the autumnal afterglow that provides some late season blooms and or berries. So early spring ephemerals. Um, this is a, a picture uh, of Ewing Park down in Des Moines uh, that shows what what happens of the woodland of, of much of Iowa, deciduous woodlands, is that trees don't leaf out real early in the spring. So there's a lot of sunlight in the base of the, the forest early on in the season. So we've got a lot of plants that bloom early on, complete their life cycle, and are, are done for the rest of the season. So let's take a look at some of those. Here is the uh, anemone canadensis, the windflower or Canada anemone. Uh, this plant is a one to two feet tall. It has these white sort of cup-shaped flowers. Uh, blooms in uh, from April into early June with these white flowers and it works best in part shade not dense shade if the shades too dense it tends to be a little bit floppy compare that to the anemone kinkafolia or wood anemone uh, a little bit lower growing this one's only about a half to three quarters of a foot tall instead of one or two feet and it spreads by rhizomes that produce tubers or, or, or rootsness tubers and uh, it also blooms about the same time as the Canada anemone from April through June uh, with white flowers, uh, occasionally sort of a pinkish cast. You can see the one on the right there has a bit of a more of a pinkish cast to it. And a difference from the previous one, the quincifolia has five part leaves. If you look closely at the leaves, there's sort of five leaflets there. And this one does uh, die down by midsummer, so uh, it's you can distinguish that between the Canada anemone and the wood anemone. Marsh marigold, Caltha palustris, uh, is often a very early uh, spring bloomer by April, and it may continue into bloom into June. Um, and boy, the bright, bright color of this yellow marigold uh, plant uh, certainly brightens up the shade. Uh, doesn't do well in dense shade, but certainly part shade, it's great. It's a great one for moist or even boggy sites. Uh, you often find it growing in wet seeps. Uh, so if uh, great for rain gardens that way. Um, it will grow in full sun and flowers best in full sun, but 
because of the heat from full sun, it may go dormant during uh, the midsummer if it is in full sun. In part shade, the foliage may stay throughout the summer. Um, the marigold name is a bit of a misnomer. It's not related at all to the uh, common Tajidis marigold, uh, but actually is more uh, closely related to the buttercup. Uh, here, cardamine concatenata, or fringed toothwort. Um, I originally learned it as dentaria lacinata, uh, which made more sense to me because dent means tooth, and lacinata is sort of the uh, lacy edge foliage, but uh, botanists have changed the name to cardamine. Uh, so we'll need to learn that. Anyway, this is one of the, the true uh, spring ephemerals. Uh, it has these uh, sort of white flowers with a pinkish blush to them. And the, the toothwort part comes not only from the, the toothed or, or uh, dentated foliage, but the root system is also toothed. Um, and it, it's sometimes also called a pepper root because the uh, roots are edible and sometimes have been cut up to add sort of a spicy radish-like flavor to uh, salads. Uh, I should perhaps point out at this point, uh, we don't recommend digging up wildflowers um, or transplanting them from the wild into your yard. You should only uh, grow nursery propagated wildflowers or perhaps rescue plants if there's a construction site going in and, and plants are going to be removed anyway that might be a rescue operation but uh, we're not uh, advocating the removal of these wildflowers from the woodlands to move to your own landscape claytonia virginiana or spring beauty um, is another ephemeral type plant um, it has the white flowers with the pink stripes to it, the sort of nectary guides guiding the uh, pollinators into the, the, the nectar source there. Um, it grows either in part shade to uh, sun, and uh, it actually even will grow on the prairies, but it's much less common there. So you almost always find it in, in woodlands, but it uh, uh, blooms early in the springtime and then uh, is dies out later in the summer. This is actually a member of the purse lane family and forms corms, similar to crocus. Corydalus, um, yellow fumewort, uh, also known as pale corydalus or yellow harlequin, uh, blooms in April and May with these yellow flowers in uh, part shade. It uh, actually self-seeds and actually performs more as a winter annual than a perennial. So uh, the, the seeds germinate in the fall. Um, and then flowers early in the springtime, and then it dies back completely through the summer. This is a, a close relative of the uh, smaller uh, bleeding hearts. If you look closely at the flower, you might be able to see that. Another uh, bleeding heart relative is the uh, Dutchman's breeches, or Dicentra cucularia. Um, this one, uh, you can see sort of the grayish green foliage with a sort of fringe to it. Um, it uh, has these uh, upside down flowers, if you will, that look a little bit like pantaloons or pant pants. Uh, that's where the Dutchman's Breeches name comes in. Primarily white, although you can see they often do develop sort of a pinkish cast to some of them. Um, it uh, tolerates d uh, clay soil and it's rabbit resistant. So uh, if you've got rabbits in your yard in shade, this might be one to think about, at least for some spring color. But remember, it's ephemeral, so it's going to die down by midsummer. The Dodecathion, or shooting star, you can see how it gets that name. It has these reflexed petals, either in pink, white, or lavender, uh, that look a little bit like shooting stars dr falling to the ground. Um, this does not tolerate wet soil, uh, but it will grow either in full shade or part shade, so a good uh, spring ephemeral plant in that regard. The dog tooth violets. There's the Americanum, which is the yellow dog tooth, or the white one, which is uh, also sometimes called trout lily, actually both uh, commonly maybe known as the trout lily, um, also known as white fawn lily or uh, adder's tongue and yellow snowdrop for the yellow dog tooth violet. Uh, all these names, the, the, the trout lily uh, or the fawn name 
come from that speckled or spotted foliage. You can see it's got splotches on the, the foliage there from the darker spots. Uh, so that uh, gives it sort of a camouflage effect. Um, both of these will grow either in full shade or part shade. And they form corms, but they uh, spread very slowly that way. Uh, don't spread very readily by seed either, and it takes them up to seven years to, to reach blooming size. Uh, one of the ways that if they do form seeds that they uh, spread and make new colonies is that uh, they rely on ants to spread the seed. The seed has a little nutritive uh, coating on the one edge of it that the ants uh, will feed on. They'll take the seed, move it to their ant hill or ant colony, and uh, plant the seeds there, and that's the way new colonies of dogtooth and violet get started. Virginia waterleaf, hydrophyllum, uh, so named because of early on in the season, its foliage has, as you see on the right there, the sort of silvery splotches on the leaf. It looks a little bit like the uh, water spots have, have developed there. Uh, as the leaf ages, it becomes more solid green. So on the left there, you see a more solid green effect as it's in bloom with these uh, Symes of, of, of purplish lavender flowers. Um, the foliage does stay uh, throughout the summer, uh, but it kind of recedes into the background because it no longer has the, the water-spotted look to it. But quite attractive in the springtime uh, with the uh, silver splotching. A native that's known by probably just about everyone is the Virginia bluebell. Uh, we mentioned earlier that not only does it come in the uh, medium blue that we see there on the left, but it also many times will have a, a pinkish or more purplish cast to it, and even white is a possibility. Now, uh, this is also a true uh, ephemeral in that um, once it, after it blooms for several weeks in the springtime, the foliage dies down completely, and then there's nothing there uh, in that area for the rest of the summer. So it does quite well either in full shade or part shade. And uh, it, it does spread pretty readily uh, f through colonies. Uh, so it, it'll self-seed and uh, spreads a little bit with it's more of a tap-rooted nature to it. The woodland phlox, Phlox de Vericata, uh, also known as Wild Sweet William, uh, has these rose or lavender to violet blue type flowers that grows either in full shade to part shade. And uh, this is one that deer tend to not like. So uh, it's great for uh, areas that have a lot of deer, uh, grows well in droughty soils, clay soils, and it, it forms uh, pretty dense colonies. You can see there in the uh, right hand photo that uh, it spreads to make a, a pretty good ground cover that's about uh, three-fourths to a foot tall. Uh, makes a good ground cover in the springtime. May apple. Um, the, the may apple is named for the fruit that develops. And I should point out that the uh, native species has more of a yellowish fruit, and that's shown in the, the lower right. The flower is right above that. Uh, and the flowers, although they could be quite showy, they're often hidden from view under the sort of umbrella-like uh, leaf of the may apple. Uh, the bright red fruit that you see there on the left is actually a non-native species, the, the Himalayan may apple, uh, Potophyllum hexandrum. Um, so there's nothing wrong with growing some of these uh, non-native species that are closely related. Uh, they can provide some interest in the landscape as well. An early spring bloomer is the bloodroot, uh, Sanguinaria canadensis, um, named for the sort of reddish orange sap that uh, the, the all parts of the plant produce. Um, Native Americans actually use that sap as a, a dye uh, to get that sort of reddish color. Uh, flowers are, as you can see here, uh, multiple petaled uh, white blooms, and uh, the, the blooms come out just as the leaves are unfolding. In the uh, left-hand photo there, you can see the uh, bloodroot foliage is the larger foliage there with the, the deep indentations on it. 
the silvery splotched one is actually one of the Virginia water leaf. So that's not the foliage of the uh, anemone. The anemone fo or the bloodroot. The the bloodroot foliage is the uh, larger foliage there in the above the flower. Trilliums. Uh, the trilliums are so named because they have three petals. So tri trillium. Uh, this is the uh, uh, trillium grandiflorum, uh, large flowered trillium. Uh, sometimes called a white wake robin. Um, there's also a regular wake robin, which has red uh, petals to it. Um, so several different types of trilliums are native. Uh, this one will bloom from uh, April into June, perhaps, and it goes uh, does well in, in full shade to part shade. Um, it is rhizomatous, uh, so it spreads slowly through rhizomes, but it, it doesn't make uh, big colonies very, very quickly. So it also it doesn't uh, transplant very well, and it needs moist soil to grow well. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, ants will spread the seed of this uh, uh, as well as some other types. The marybells or uvularia. Um, uh, is a uh, yellow-flowered uh, spring ephemeral. As you notice, we haven't seen a lot of yellow so far in, in the mix. So it's a nice contrast for some of the other uh, uh, ephemerals uh, because it does provide a little bit of uh, bright color from the yellow. Um, this uh, plant blooms in April and May, uh, grows well from full shade to part shade, uh, tolerates drought and dry soil, and it even works as a cut flower. Uh, it's got those one and a half to two foot tall stems that uh, if you cut them off, they'll uh, work pretty well as a cut flower. Uh, you'll note also that those, that sort of the twisting to the petals, and that's characteristic of the, the Mary Bells. Now, uh, ferns and foliage plants, uh, ferns of course don't truly flower, they produce spores. Uh, some of the other foliage plants in here are are uh, plants that do produce flowers, but they're usually insignificant, so they're known mostly for the, the foliage. So let's take a look at some of these. Sweet flag, or a chorus. Um, the native one has solid green foliage, uh, but there are a number of native ours, if you will, or selections that have variegation. So we've got the variegata there that has the white edge to it. Um, the, uh, there's also a golden edged form uh, on the right. Other names for sweet flag are sweet sedge, sweet grass, sweet rush. And these names can be a little bit confusing because they're not a, a rush or a grass or a sedge. Um, they're actually uh, uh, related to more of in the, in the lily family. The flowers are very inconspicuous and will grow anywhere from part shade to sun. Um, the rhizomes are fragrant, and that's where the sweet part comes in. So the the the, the fragrance is very spicy. Um, sometimes it has been used as a substitute for ginger, nutmeg, and cinnamon. Um, so a, a, a good uh, ornamental plant there. The northern maidenhair fern, fern uh, Adiantum pedatum, uh, is uh, a plant with a compound frond. That is, the uh, individual frond has a palmately uh, divided uh, stem, and then each of the leaflets uh, or, or uh, subdivisions is pinnately divided. So uh, you can see there that the, they create sort of an umbrella-like effect, uh, grows from full shade to part shade, um, and as most ferns do, it, it needs good moisture. Um, it can form a larger clumps from the rhizomes, um, and uh, definitely you want to not grow this one in the sun because those fronds readily turn brown if it's too hot uh, too dry or they get too much sun. Wild ginger, um, I you can see, does have flowers, those uh, sort of maroon flowers about an inch or so across in diameter, inch to two inches in diameter, um, are born underneath the heart-shaped leaves. So 
really the only way you see them is if you get down on your hands and knees and lift up the foliage to, to find the flowers. So that's why I'm including it here on the, the foliage plants because it really is grown primarily for those heart-shaped uh, leaves that have a velvety uh, covering or downy, downy texture to them. Um, even though its uh, common name includes ginger, it's not related to the culinary ginger at all. Instead, it's related to uh, Dutchman's pipe. Um, but the, the uh, roots do smell rather gingery, and it has been used as a ginger substitute uh, in the past. Um, so that's where it comes gets the, the wild ginger name. This is really a, a great ground cover plant that's uh, uh, not uh, desired by deer at all, so the deer don't eat it. Uh, great for uh, heavy shade, and it also makes a good uh, erosion control. So if you've got a fairly steep slope with a shade, this uh, wild ginger can prevent erosion there on that slope. The lady fern, uh, Ethereum felix femina, uh, perhaps you can see there has very upright um, fronds uh, that make it look a little bit like a badminton shuttlecock. Um, the one on the left is actually a, a native R called lady in red. And if you look closely at it, you can see that the rachis or the, the central stem of the frond has a deep maroon uh, cast to it. Um, most of the uh, species has more of just of a, a, a brownish green cast. So the one on the right is, is the, the um, non-reddish uh, form. Um, this plant is rabbit resistant uh, and tolerates drier soil than a lot of ferns, so might be one that you want to think about uh, if you uh, uh, have a rabbit problem or, or fairly dry soil. Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. Uh, most sedges really do best in wet sites. This one, of course, will tolerate wet sites, but it, uh, it uh, tolerates full sun and drier sites than a lot of sedges, so a good one. So if you're looking for a sort of a grassy type effect of a ground cover, um, the Pennsylvania sedge might be a great choice for uh, a native selection there. Um, it does have a rhizomes, but it doesn't spread rapidly through rhizomes like Kentucky bluegrass would, but more uh, rather just getting sort of a little bit larger clump each year from those rhizomes. The crested wood fern, or Dryoptus cristata, um, if you look closely at the picture on the right, you can see that there's actually two different forms of the fronds. Um, the very upright ones are uh, fertile. Uh, that is, they're the ones that are going to bear the, the spores, and the ones that are more out, outward growing or, or spreading are non-fertile, so they don't have spores. So uh, by the combination of the two, you get a nice full-looking plant. Um, uh, this one is a great one that uh, is deer resistant and has uh, short creeping rhizomes. The cinnamon fern, Os Osmondastrum, used to be known just as Osmonda, but it's been changed to a different uh, genus. Uh, uh, perhaps you can see how or why it would be named cinnamon fern. The uh, central fronds there uh, are non flowering, but they're spike like fertile fronds. Uh, with the, where the spores, they look a little bit like a cinnamon stick. And so that's how the, the fern gets its name. Um, the uh, This plant, uh, the cinnamon fern, is one that does like moisture, and it tolerates clay soil, grows well in full shade to, to partial shade. A fairly closely related one, the Osmunda uh, claytoniana, I said uh, the previous one, the cinnamon fern, used to be called Osmunda, but it's been moved to a different genus. The Osmunda here, interrupted fern, uh, the interrupted name comes from, uh, if you look there on the one on the left, you can see there's sort of the brownish uh, segments there uh, where there should, would normally be um, side uh, leaflets of the, the frond, uh, but those are the fertile um, spore producing structures on this fern. So it looks like there's kind of a gap in the front, and that's where the interrupted part comes in. The uh, This Osmunda, uh, perhaps you've heard of the Osmunda fiber. Um, Osmunda fiber is uh, used sometimes in growing orchids. They grind up the uh, the uh, 
part of the plant here and uh, creates a substrate for growing orchids uh, rather than, say, peat moss uh, for growing other plants. Solomon seal, um, polygonatum, uh, the biflorum, uh, there's a, a large form and a small form. The straight biflorum is smaller and the commutatum is a larger uh, plant that grows up to uh, five or six feet tall uh, and the smaller one usually only grows uh, one to three feet tall. It blooms in May and you can see biflorum there are two flowers per node, so the biflorum, uh, grows well in part shade, uh, spreads through rhizomes, and it uh, creates or produces black berries by fall. Um, the flowers are actually quite fragrant in the springtime as well. Christmas fern, Polysticum acrosticoides, is so named because its foliage stays green late, late into the season, usually still green even at, at Christmas time. Uh, so it's pretty much an evergreen or, or almost evergreen even here in Iowa. Um, grows well in full shade to part shade, tolerates deer and rabbits, drought, erosion, heavy shade, shallow rocky soil. So as you can tell, this is one tough plant. So uh, this is a, a great one to uh, think about growing if you need a, a tough background plant for your shady site. Moving along to some of our spring and summer standbys, now I should point out uh, these are not native plants in this image. The astilbe and hosta are, are not native to uh, North America. Um, they both like moisture. They're native to uh, the uh, um, Orient. Um, but we, as I mentioned earlier, no reason you can't grow uh, some introduced plants, but uh, here you'll find some native plants that, that might fill in some of those categories as well. Now you'll also often find as we talk about these that a lot of these are going to be plants that need part shade or will tolerate even uh, full sun. So a lot of these are not going to be for dense shade, but uh, will grow well even though we may have part shade. The yarrow, uh, Achillea millifolium, the native form is the white one on the right. And some sources actually uh, call this an introduced plant. Um, may not ever completely uh, solve that uh, controversy, but um, the, the native one, the one that grows, or if it's not native, it's naturalized. The white form is the one on the right. There are many, many uh, native vars that have been developed. You see the pink grapefruit on the left there. It's part of the uh, Tutti Frutti series. Um, this plant, um, the, the native one, the, the white form, has ferny-like foliage that actually can be almost aggressive in growth out in full sun. So growing it in uh, part shade does slow down its growth a bit, which may be a desirable feature. Uh, the uh, native columbine, Aquilegia canadensis, uh, grows in part shade, and it has the uh, red spurs with the central yellow uh, flower cup. Um, it uh, tolerates rabbits pretty well. Um, deer are not attracted to it. Uh, hummingbirds love it, and uh, it does tend to self-seed and spread around a bit. Um, there is a native R called Corbett, which has sort of a pale yellow. It uh, doesn't have the uh, red spurs, uh, so you have some choices there. Um, this also tends to be more resistant to columbine leaf miner than a lot of the uh, selections or, or other species of, of uh, columbine. Goat's beard, Aruncus diocus, uh, blooms uh, from late April in, in through June with these creamy white uh, flowers that sort of droopy uh, characteristic to them. And that's where the goat's beard name comes from. It looks like a little bit like the uh, goat's, the, underneath the goat's chin, the little beard there. Um, this one tolerates rabbits quite well. Uh, also good for rain gardens, so it'll, it'll uh, grow well in, in temporarily moist areas. Um, obviously, the, that white really stands out in the shade, so a great, uh, fairly tall plant, four to six feet tall, so uh, adds a lot of drama to the shady landscape. Uh, 
the round leaf bellflower, Campanula rotundifolia, named because of the little small roundish leaves, and the Campana is Italian for little bell, and uh, that's definitely what these are. They look like little blue bells. Um, I'm showing there Olympica, which is a, a native R, uh, one that's been selected for its uh, extra uh, amount of bloom. Um, this is a great one that blooms all the way from June through September, uh, particularly if you uh, deadhead it, cut it back periodically, it'll uh, send out additional bloom. Uh, this is one that, that deer tend to leave alone, so if you've got deer problems, this might be one to think about. Here's the tall bellflower. This one used to be called a Campanula, but now has been moved to a different genus, Com Campanulastrum. And rather than perennial like the uh, previous one, this is actually an annual or biennial. Uh, grows quite tall, three to six feet tall, blooms from June through August with these outward facing blue bell-like flowers. Uh, grows well in part shade to sun, uh, and those flowers kind of surround the stem. Lots of the lady slipper orchids, uh, either the pink or the yellow types. Um, the pink lady slipper there on the right is uh, Cypripedium ecoli. Uh, grows only a half foot tall to one and a half feet tall and blooms in May and June. Um, the lesser yellow lady slipper uh, on the left, the, the yellow lady slipper, Cypripedium parviflorum, uh, blooms in May and June with a yellow um, pouch and the sort of magenta brown um, petals or sepals. And then uh, there's also a showy pink lady slipper, which is actually the Minnesota state flower, uh, blooms in May and June uh, with pink and white. Uh, and both of these are all these grow in, in part shade. Um, one thing about the lady slipper orchids is they need an endomycorrhizae to survive. So um, uh, they form an association with uh, a beneficial fungus in the soil. And so this is definitely one not good to dig up unless you have some of that mycorrhizae to, to support the growth of it. The geranium maculatum, uh, perennial uh, geranium or cranes bill, wild geranium, uh, blooms in April and May with the pink or sort of lilac blooms. Um, there are some cultivars or selections that will rebloom uh, throughout the, the rest of the season, but they make a great uh, ground cover type plant, even it, with just in foliage. And um, the blooms themselves do attract butterflies, so a good plant in that regard. Hookera or alum root. Um, been a lot of breeding work done in recent years on hookera and hybrids. Now this is a different species than the true coral bells, although the coral bells is one of the common names for this. The coral bells blooms with uh, pink flower stalks. As you see here, the uh, Native Americana has white flower stalks. And there's been a lot of hybridization done between two species and other species. There's hookera villosa and other species. Um, the Americana tends to be a little bit more uh, drought tolerant than uh, the, the purple foliage types. Um, and it's great for either sun or part shade and uh, great for drought tolerance. You can see one of the uh, native R's that's been developed there, caramel with sort of the caramelly bronzy foliage. Um, jewelweed, Impatiens capensis, is a uh, native annual flower. Uh, a large plant uh, gets to be uh, anywhere from two to five feet tall with these orange or yellow orange spotted flowers uh, in full shade to part shade loves wet soils clay and heavy shade uh, interesting fact about the jewel weed is sometimes called spotted touch me not and uh, it's well known that the sap of this plant is a uh, uh, a that will something that will um, counteract the uh, stings of insects or poison ivy or stinging nettles. So if you're out hiking and you uh, get a stinging nettle, uh, look for some jewelweed to, to counteract that stinging. The wood lily, Lilium philadelphicum, is uh, the most widely spread native uh, lily. It's got whorled foliage with these uh, reddish orange um, petals and kind of maroon spots on it. Um, it is grows best in part shade, not dense shade. And unfortunately, deer do like it. So if deer are a problem, this may not be one for you to grow. 
the cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis, uh, so named because of its brilliant red blooms, uh, attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies. Uh, this is a good one for rain gardens. It really likes moist soil and grows anywhere from part shade uh, to sun. Close relative, the blue lobelia, um, Lobelia syphilitica, is there on the left. You can see it growing right next to the water. So like the cardinal flower, it likes the moist soil. And there's also a hybrid between the syphilitica and the uh, cardinalis that's called gerardii, and it forms purple flowers, as you see there on the right. Mimulus, or monkey flower, um, is uh, a, a plant that likes wet soil and actually sometimes grown directly in water as a water garden plant. This one grows one to three feet tall, blooms all the way from June through September with these lilac uh, purplish flowers, and it does spread a bit through rhizomes, but not uh, invasively at all. Here's a really unique plant, the ghost plant, Monotropa uniflora. No chlorophyll at all, so it is completely dependent on getting its energy from actually a, a, a mycorrhizae, which in turn uh, feeds on uh, trees and plants. So it's a, this is a parasitic plant of the mycorrhizae, and the mycorrhizae form a beneficial organ, um, relationship with tree roots. So it's a, a three-way partnership for this to, to form. And because there's no chlorophyll, this can grow in very dense shade um, because it doesn't need the uh, sunlight for chlorophyll formation. Obedient plant, Physostegia virginiana, um, is a plant for part shade uh, to uh, full sun. Um, probably part shade is better because it can spread pretty aggressively in sun. So you may want to grow it in a dry site so it doesn't spread as much. Uh, blooms from June through September with uh, white to pink flowers. Also called obedient plant because you can um, maneuver the, the individual blossoms to stay put in the shape that you uh, bend them. Jacob's Ladder, or polemonium, uh, so-called because the, uh, the foliage there, uh, the compound foliage, looks a little bit like rungs of a ladder moving up. Uh, I'm showing one native R there with called Heavenly Habit that has larger and more open uh, blue flowers. Um, it does bloom uh, from April through June, uh, best in uh, part shade to sun, and it is a deer tolerant plant. So uh, uh, it does sometimes self seed, but not a, a spreading invasive type of thing. Prunella or self heal is uh, a uh, so named because it was used in folk medicine for healing irritated skin. So it's got some medicinal properties there. Um, flowers purple to pink and grows in part shade to sun. Uh, the foliage is also edible, um, so it can be used in salads. Makes a nice little ground cover. Ruelia or wild petunia, uh, not related to petunia at all, but the flower shape is somewhat like petunia, so it's got the sort of purplish lavender trumpet flowers. Um, grows best in sun to part shade uh, and is one that self-seeds pretty readily, almost to the point of becoming weedy, but uh, it, it uh, very showy type plant um, and tolerant of a lot of uh, conditions. The celandine poppy or uh, woodland poppy, Stelophrum difilum, uh, bright yellow flowers uh, in uh, April through June, uh, grows anywhere from full shade to part shade tolerates um, wet soils, and it can self-seed, uh, so it can spread around a little bit. This one produces a yellow sap that was used as a dye by Native Americans. Spiderwort, Tradescantia ohioensis, uh, has these uh, three-petaled flowers uh, on grassy-type foliage. Um, blooms all the way from May through August, uh, but I find that it works best if you deadhead it because if you don't deadhead, it will self-seed and can spread almost to the point of becoming uh, in invasive or aggressive. Um, deer and rabbits may eat the foliage, but it's not one of their preferred foods, so uh, not something I find they have to worry about uh, a great deal. The uh, common blue violet, of course, there are many different species of violets, and uh, sometimes they're considered weeds, but uh, certainly beautiful, attractive little uh, f flower uh, in the uh, primarily springtime, but can bloom all summer long. Um, 
They tolerate deer, clay, and this is one plant that definitely grows under black walnuts too. So if you've got shade of a black walnut, this might be one to consider for that uh, type of site. Our last few plants here are what I call the uh, autumnal afterglow, uh, those that may actually bloom early in the season, but uh, berries come later in the season uh, to provide some interest late in that summer growth. So one of those is the white baneberry. The uh, flowers in the lower right there uh, bloom uh, primarily in May and June, uh, but then the berries form, this uh, long racine of berries, uh, and called doll's eye because the center of each berry has a kind of a black dot that makes it look a little bit like the, the eye of a doll. You can see the foliage there on the left, sort of grayish green, uh, nice cut leaf foliage, so attractive foliage even when it's not in bloom, and then the fall uh, show from the, the white berries. Now, called bane berry because they are highly poisonous. So uh, if you have small children, they need to know not to uh, eat these berries, uh, or perhaps you don't want to have this plant around. Closely related is the red bane berry. And so uh, similarly, uh, highly poisonous, uh, white flowers early in the season, and then red berries later on in the foil. This one likes rich, moist, organic soil. White snake root, Agiratina altissima, which used to be known as Eupatorium rugosum. Um, uh, also, the, the common name here, white snake root, comes from the fact that the uh, roots used to be used to counteract snake bites. Um, this is a late uh, summer to fall bloomer in September and October. Large plant, three to five feet tall. Grows well in full shade, to part shade, or even full sun. Um, and it's good for rain gardens because it will tolerate the wet soil. One thing you need to know about this is it spreads readily by seed. So uh, once these flowers form and start fading, you may want to deadhead it so that it doesn't become a, a pesky weed by spreading through the, the seeds. Um, Jack in the Pulpit, or its other close relatives of Arisimus. Um, the green dragon foliage you see there on the left is a much uh, larger leaf, more uh, finely divided. The Jack in the Pulpit is uh, Arisima trifilla, uh, so it's got three petals to the, the or the three uh, leaflets to the leaf. And there you can see the, the Jacks in the Pulpit there on the right. Both produce uh, reddish-orange berries that uh, show up late in the fall. Um, both also do quite well uh, from full shade to part shade, uh, grow well under the uh, shade of a black walnut, and they will uh, tolerate wet soils quite well. Now, these berries are poisonous, so uh, you want to uh, avoid uh, eating those. Turtle head is so named because of the shape of the flower. Looks a little bit like a turtle's head poking out of a shell. The uh, Colony glabra is typically white, although it may have pinkish cast to it. Um, you're also seeing here uh, the pink turtle head, which is uh, usually Colony leonii, uh, native to a little bit further south than Iowa, but uh, uh, also makes a, a great plant. Um, you can see perhaps there that it does spread and create a, a pretty solid uh, mass of flowers. Um, so it works somewhat like a ground cover there. Um, good for wet sites, so good for rain gardens, tolerates deer, and also works pretty well as a cut flower. So lots of options for the turtle head. The Cornus canadensis is a bunch berry um, related to... Um, <clears throat> the flowering dogwood, um, so it's got white, uh, those are not actually flowers, they're sepals, or the, the things that we might call a petal on the flowers. Uh, the flower is actually just the center part, but sepals look like a flower, and then they form berries, uh, orange-red berries. This is a low-growing ground cover um, that's only about uh, a quarter, uh, four inches to, to 12, eight inches tall. Uh, and it spreads by rhizomes to make a nice ground cover. Um, those berries are attractive to birds, and unfortunately deer will eat it too, so if you've got a deer problem, this may not work well as a ground cover for you. Uh, the bottle gentian, uh, deep purple flowers in uh, uh, October. Um, occasionally they do pink or, or white flowers, but they're best for part shade to sun. Um, Interesting, because the, the 
flower never fully opens, uh, it requires bumblebees to pollinate it because the bumblebees are tough enough they can push open those petals and, and get in there and pollinate this plant. False Solomon seal, Mayanthemum racemosum, uh, sometimes also called false lily of the valley or Solomon's plume. You can see it in bloom there on the right. They have these plumy type blooms in, in May. Uh, and then later on, it develops the uh, reddish uh, berries that you see there on the left. Um, these reddish berries on the false Solomon seal are born at the end of the uh, stem rather than in leaf axles like the uh, Solomon seal, which we saw a little bit earlier. Um, it grows anywhere from part shade to full shade. Berries can be blackish red and the birds will eat them. Uh, deer will eat this foliage, so that's not really deer tolerant. Ginseng, Panax quinquefolius, um, grown uh, medicinally, uh, used in herb tonics and traditional medicines, uh, sometimes as an aphrodisiac as well. Uh, but this is something that uh, is grown commercially under uh, part shade. Um, and uh, certainly we don't recommend harvesting from the wild. You may grow it in your own yard if you've got a, a source of that. It takes a uh, full six years for, it to, for the roots to develop to a point where they can be harvest, harvested for use in, in those traditional areas. But certainly these uh, greenish white flowers in the spring and then the red berries in fall um, are quite attractive. Virginia creeper, Parthenocystis quinquefolia, uh, five leaflet leaves there, uh, mostly kind of in the background until late summer or fall when it turns a brilliant red climbing up the trees. So you've probably often seen those. Uh, it grows anywhere from part shade to uh, full sun. And it does have rather insignificant uh, purplish black berries that are sometimes mistaken as grapes, uh, but they, they are not edible. And then we have the pokeweed, Phytolacca americana, um, also sometimes called poke salad or pigeon berry or ink berry uh, because the deep purple berries do stain, uh, create a, a, an inky stain. And uh, the poke salad name comes from the fact that uh, settlers often used the emerging foliage in the springtime uh, as uh, one of their first uh, salad type crops. Important to remember, though, that all parts of this plant are poisonous. And uh, especially once they develop the sort of reddish or purplish uh, n nature to the stem, they're highly toxic. So uh, only harvest very early in the season and put it through at least two boiling waters to, to get rid of or deactivate some of those toxins. So uh, this is one that's going to uh, grow at the edge of the, uh, uh, the, the forest, so uh, part shade to sun. A large plant, uh, six to eight feet tall, uh, forms a perennial uh, large taproot that's difficult to eradicate, uh, but certainly you can see uh, sort of the, the attractive nature of the, the uh, f developing f berries and, and flower stock there. So um, that wraps up our, our shade plants, native shade plants. As I said, we certainly don't think you should limit your palette of plants to native plants, but this perhaps gives you some ideas for additional plants that you may not be able to uh, find as readily in nurseries. You may have to search out a little bit for native nursery sources for these native plants. Next, we're going to have Dallas County Master Gardener Megan Will present to us about the Search for Excellence Award. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our Growing Season webcast. My name is Megan Will, and I'm from Dallas County. And we'll be talking a little bit about um, our advisory committee and what we do with that, and also our search for excellence. I took the Master Gardener class in 2005 in Woodbury County, and uh, I got involved originally just because, like most of you, you just wanted to learn how to grow plants and make your stuff even more beautiful at home. But after I got into the program, um, I realized how beneficial it was and how much I then enjoyed teaching others how much I love to grow things, and it allowed me to meet great people and make some lifelong friends. I was also then asked to um, join the um, advisory committee here for our state, and I am actually the chair of our Master Gardener Advisory Committee. I now live in Des Moines, so Dallas County, 
And so I'm in the central region and I just joined because I wanted to help make our Master Gardener program as great and if not better than all the other states. Our committee is made up of Master Gardeners and Extension staff from five areas plus state staff that supports the Master Gardener program. So we have in all five of these areas, the Northwest, the Northeast, the Central, the Southeast, and the Southwest, we have staff and volunteers from all, all of the areas of the state on our committee, which kind of gives us a nice cross section as to what everybody's doing across the state. And as part of the advisory committee, we look at ways to bring our state up to the national standards and even even more and what we can do in the long run to be ahead of the curve on some things. So that's why we have changed our hours to the 10 hours of education and 20 hours of volunteer so we can be equal within the national. Although we do have an average of 60 volunteer hours per master gardener. So we are above the average, but we just thought we should be make it mandatory that that we are above average. <laughs> the international search for excellence is very similar to our Iowa search for excellence, but it is international. It is all 50 states plus Canada, South Korea, do you believe England? So it is a pretty big deal and we're going to talk about our Iowa Search for Excellence so that we, um, as a state, if we have any winners, we can then send them on to the International um, Search for Excellence, which there was just the one passed in the fall in Council Bluffs, and the next one will be in 2017 in Portland, Oregon. So what we're going to talk about now is our Iowa Search for Excellence Award. Our awards started we awarded the first ones in 2013. What we did is we took the International Search for Excellence Award and we tweaked it, worked it for here for the state of Iowa. We felt that we needed to recognize our master gardeners here in Iowa for all the great work they're doing, educating, um, putting on events, educating the youth, all different um, age. And we just felt that we needed to show everybody the great work you guys are doing and also to bring others into the Master Gardener program. So, so far in 2013, we have had Mills County, Lynn, West Potomy County win. In 2014, we had Cass, Boone, and Warren. And then in 2015, we had Marshall, Polk, Johnson, and Buchanan. So, so far quite a few nice little across the state there. What we want to talk about, though, are kind of the, the principles, what we really want to focus on with our search for excellence. We really want to know what groups you're targeting, the long-term impacts, the regular impacts, the educational aspect of it, um, more like the long-term as, you know, is the project sustainable, is it something you're doing on a long-term basis that will continue to grow generally both in plant form and in the program form. We're going to talk about the examples here. So for our group, this is one of our winners. This was our 2015 winner, Johnson County. They had 45 master gardeners that were involved in offering an educational experience at the Johnson County Fair. They focused on providing information about pollinators. They had a very neat uh, display. They did basically a supersized hoop house with um, netting so they could keep the butterflies in. And they had it all pollinator plants in there and they had butterflies in there so people could walk through there, kind of see what kind of plants that the pollinators, the butterflies like so they could then go home and plant those in their own yard and they had built a community partnership and they increased the education on the pop on the pollinators they had 14,000 visitors so that was a great project I mean you had 45 master gardeners take involvement in this program and you hit 14,000 volunteers so 
Th these are the type of impacts that we, you know, we want to be able to show not only to the whole state of Iowa, but elsewhere to the international that, you know, we're, we're taking what we're learning and we're passing it on. Now, our long term, in 2015, we also had Buchanan County win, and I'm going to mess up this name, the Wapsican Mill. I know exactly where this mill is. <laughs> I was born in Independence, so I know where this is, but I could never say it. But they made a great, uh, next to the mill was just some grassy area that kind of had been neglected and they wanted to um, restore it, kind of show you what Iowa once was, the tall grass prairie. So they planted and they have signage to bring awareness to the native plants because the Wapsican Mill is a historical landmark and um, they have quite a few visitors go there every year so that's just another way that you have some lasting impact people are, can see oh this was you know a native prairie and these are the plants that I can plant these in my own yard then we have our education this was Polk County in 2015 they do Polk County has a very beautiful display at the Discovery Garden which is on the Iowa State Fairground so of course they have thousands and thousands of people that visit the Iowa State Fair so what better way to educate is you have a very large audience and they have a very beautiful garden so they came up with very nice labels for plants to tell you what they are and how to you know a little bit about you know sun shade so that you know you go there you see it you don't have to find somebody you can you know, write down what that plant was and then you can go home but it's another great kind of silent way to educate, you know. It, it's at least getting them to then maybe go home and look up what they saw, learn a little bit more about it. So there's a lot of ways we can be educating that, you know, sometimes you don't realize that you are. And our impact. Um, Boone County in 2014 won with their Immersion in Wellness Garden. They had over 120 youth participating in gardening at the 4-H camp. And participants gained garden knowledge and they ate fresh food. And I know some of these, um, from reading their submission, some of these vegetables were the first time they'd ever tried some of these. So um, you're getting the kids involved, they're getting dirty, but then they're getting to eat what they grow. And that's huge impact. Um, which we take for granted that most kids have tried all the vegetables because most kids say they don't like them until they try them and then they like them. <laughs> so those are some examples of the of past winners. And these are some examples of the measured impact that this is kind of what we're looking for when you do a search for excellent. We're looking for the number of participants so you can do that, you know, by just simply counting them or if your event is being held at a park, you can, um, if it's a park you have to pay admission to, you can ask, you know, how many people visit this park in a year or in a month. You can also, we want to measure the knowledge, so behavior changes. So if you have an event, we want, we want you to be thinking, you know, how do I know if these people are going to change their behavior? Well, a simple little survey that has two or three questions. It doesn't have to be this big, long, seven-page survey. But simply asking them, what you learned today, are you going to maybe water differently? Are you maybe going to try a new vegetable in your garden? These are just things that when you, as a as a master gardener group, just decide you you want to do an event, whether you put this on just for yourselves, you put this on for the public, or if you want to submit it for Search for Ex Excellence, or you just want to do it because it needs to be done in your county. But these are still questions that you should be asking yourself and your committee. What are they going to learn, and how are we going to know if they're going to learn anything? So always be thinking of questions you can ask when you're going to put on a new event or 
questions you can ask the people you know before or after the event. Here's a simple little survey tool. You know, please rate your level of knowledge on the following subject before attending the workshop. So let's say your topic is vegetable gardening. What's their knowledge level? They may circle one or two. Well, after the the talk, I'm hoping they're going to circle four or five. Well, this is a great little tool that you can make sure that, you know, they're understanding what is being taught, you know, that maybe their behavior is going to change. They're going to try something new. So preparing an application, you know, you want to make sure that you are partnered with your county extension and outreach. And when you have their support, always works a lot better. And then you want to choose a project category. And then we have March 15th here. That's the, the date has been the last couple of years. It could be a little bit sooner, a little bit later, but most likely we're going to be shooting for around that, that deadline also. And so I just want to thank you for the time. And hopefully you guys can um, come up with some projects that you want to undertake or write for Search for Excellence and submit them and your name can be added to the county list. A couple questions after Megan's presentation. What are things that you could do to measure the impact of Master Gardener projects? Which Master Gardener projects would be eligible for Search for Excellence Award based on the principles shared? And what are your next steps? Please take a few moments to discuss these questions. Thank you for participating in this webcast.